Hello YouTube. So in this video I want to uh, address the question of why should we believe that there are true contradictions? What are the reasons for assuming that some contradictions might be true? Um, after all, if there are no good reasons to assume that, uh, that there are true contradictions, then we don't really have to worry about how a theory like dialetheism might work. So what are the reasons? Well, um, one of the primary motivations is actually very simple. It's the paradox. Arguments which take very reasonable assumptions apply what seem to be totally valid rules of inference to those assumptions and then derive a contradiction. And the uh, usual response to paradoxes is to assume that something has gone wrong with them, that they involve mistakes that need to be corrected. Um, in many cases, the, the mistake has been exposed and the paradox resolved, but there are some that are very, very tenacious, that resist uh, easy resolution. Um, and a dialetheist might say that the reason they resist resolution uh, is that actually nothing has gone wrong with them. They're perfectly sound arguments and they establish a true conclusion, a true contradiction. Now, the most famous paradox, without any doubt, is the liar paradox. Um, this is an extremely simple paradox that's been known for thousands of years and it's something that many many people will learn about while they're still children. So I want to give a, a sort of exposition of this paradox and some possible responses to it um, and you should sort of see some of the problems um, dealing with these with these more tenacious paradoxes. In the next video I'll probably whiz through some other paradoxes, um, but for now we'll just focus on the liar. Okay, so here is the liar paradox. This sentence is false. So what's the truth value of sentence one? Well, if you assume that one is true, um, well, clearly it, it says it's false, so if it's true, it must be false. If you assume that one is false, uh, well, it turns out to be describing itself completely accurately, which makes it true, and so on. Um, it's pretty clear that if we take this sentence at face value, then we have a contradiction, a true contradiction. Now, of course, many people do not want to take the sentence just at face value. Uh, many people propose that uh, something has gone wrong here, there's something wrong with our reasoning or with our assumptions here. Um, and so there are many ideas as to how we might solve this paradox. Um, and I want to have a look at just a few. I, I, I'm not going to go through all the possible ideas, I just want to look at a couple so you can see how the responses might work. Um, right, so one suggestion um, as to how to resolve this paradox is that maybe um, there are sentences that are neither true nor false. There are, in other words, truth value gaps. These truth value gaps are sentences that have no truth value. Um, they're neither true nor false. Um, so this suggestion is that we should essentially drop the principle of bivalence. Um, Bivalence is the principle that every proposition is either true or false. Um, and if the principle of bivalence is, is, is dropped, then that does seem to provide uh, a, a fairly easy, intuitive solution to our paradox. Um, and after all, consider that we traditionally take false to mean not true, and we traditionally take true to mean not false. So if we think about this reasoning we just saw, if we think about this, this, these two conditionals, that if one is true, then it's false. If it's false, then it's true. Well, we can perhaps rephrase that as if one is true, then it's not true. If it's false, then it's not false. So actually, even on, on sort of face value, if we assume that there are, there are truth value gaps, then we can perhaps say, that what we're, we've just reasoned our way to a truth value gap rather than, rather than reasoned our way to a contradiction. Um, so, truth value gaps. Is the liar a truth value gap? 
Well, there are true there are two problems with this kind of move. Um, the first is the problem of independent justification, and the second is the problem of revenge. Let's uh, take these two problems, two problems in order. Okay, let's say for the sake of argument that we accept the existence of truth value gaps. We still need to provide independent reasons for supposing that the liar is a truth value gap. We, we can't simply say, oh well, the liar is a gap because it would be contradictory to assign it either truth value. That would obviously beg the question against people who accept that there are true contradictions. So we need to show, we need to give reasons for supposing that the liar is in some way defective that there's something about the liar that prevents it from bearing truth value. So, so what's, what's wrong, what makes the liar a truth value gap? Well, um, we can contrast our case with other truth value gaps. So consider, for example, questions. Questions like, um, you know, could you pass the salt? Well, Pretty much everybody agrees that questions have no truth value. Questions are quite obviously not the kind of thing that could bear a truth value. Um, questions, questions might make implicit assumptions about the way the world is, and those assumptions might be true or false. So, you, you know, maybe there is no salt. Somebody might say at dinner, could you pass the salt? And maybe there actually is no salt uh, on the table or in the house which would mean that the implicit assumption in the question that there is salt is false. But if you were to respond to the question, could you pass the salt, with the statement, that's false, well, you've just obviously made a, a, a sort of category mistake there. I mean, you, you know, you wouldn't say that's false. You would say, what's salt? Or there is no salt. You wouldn't say that's false. So clearly questions um, are truth value gaps. And Generally, when we talk about truth value gaps, we don't have things like questions in mind. We're, we're just talking about propositions, declarative sentences. Um, so a more contentious example, though, might be uh, something like the present king of France is bald, reference to things that don't exist, because there is no present king of France. So is that sentence true or false? Well, we could respond that... It's neither. Since the present king of France fails to refer to anything, it fails to pick out anything in the world, there's no way to uh, assign a truth value to, to, to a sentence that attributes a, a property to the present king of France. So that's a, another contender for a truth value gap. And in that case, well, it's fairly easy to see that although the present king of France is bald, Although that sentence is the kind of sentence that could bear a truth value, it's easy to see what's defective with it. It's easy to see why it might not. Um, now, with the liar, it's rather more difficult to locate the problem. Um, well, it's perfectly grammatical. It commits no category mistakes. Uh, sentences are the kind of thing that can bear truth values or if you don't want to say that sentences are then you know, propositions, statements, whatever you can rephrase the liar as befits your views there um, it doesn't suffer from any failure of reference uh, because it's referring to itself it, it, clearly the sentence it's referring to exists, doesn't it? Uh, we can draw inferences from it, we can all intuitively understand it, it doesn't seem to be ambiguous, and so on. So what is the problem with the liar? A famous proposal was given by Saul Kripke. Um, now Kripke offered a full solution to the liar paradox that is fairly technical, and uh, I'm not going to explain it, it would uh, just take too much time um, but I, I want to give you a basic sense of his case uh, that the liar is a truth value gap. So Kripke wants to provide us with independent reasons for supposing that the liar is valueless. And to do this he draws on a concept called groundedness. So suppose we're trying to explain the meaning 
of the terms true and false to somebody who doesn't understand them. Um, what does it mean to say that a sentence is true or false? Well, an easy way of motivating understanding is to say, we can assert that a sentence is true just in case we can assert the sentence, and false just in case we would deny it. So, in other words, some sentence A, take some sentence A, well, A is true if and only if A, and A is false if and only if not A. So, we can say that A is true if and only if we would say simply A on its own, and the same for, for falsity. So, what makes A is true assertable is that we can assert A. Um, so, we can assert that snow is white. We would all assert that sentence. That's something that uh, I don't think anyone would have any objection to. And the fact that we assert snow is white entitles us to assert the sentence snow is white is true. The, um, the truth value of the sentence snow is white depends on whether or not snow is white. Snow is in fact white, so snow is white is true. Okay, we can assert snow is white is true because we would say snow is white. Uh, so the truth value of, uh, of our sentence is grounded in something outside the sentence itself. The truth value of snow is white is uh, based on whether or not snow is in fact white. And um, note that we can keep extending our truth predicates indefinitely. Uh, so, for example... Because we're entitled to assert snow is white is true, that allows us to assert snow is white is true is true. And you can see how that can go on indefinitely. The point is that you can hack off those truth predicates and eventually get to the plain assertion, the basic assertion, snow is white. Um, and that's the idea of groundedness. The truth of snow is white is true depends on the truth of snow is white, which in turn depends on whether or not snow is white. The point is that we can work down to this basic assertion, snow is white. No matter how much we extend our sentence, ultimately we come to a basic assertion, the truth value of which is derived from something outside the sentence, namely the facts as to the nature of snow. Uh, so maybe you can, it would be better to see this in a diagram. Um, we we're, we assert snow is white is true is true. Uh, the reason that we can, it's acceptable to say that snow is white is true is true. The reason it's acceptable to say that is because it's acceptable to say snow is white is true. And the reason it's acceptable to say that is because we would say snow is white. And why do we say snow is white? Well, because of the whiteness of snow. T here just stands for true. So snow is white, that's true because of the whiteness of snow. Um, so we can see how this grounds the truth of any sentence. We can extend this indefinitely, um, but ultimately we can get down, back down to this basic assertion. So how does this work in the case of the liar? This sentence is false. Well, remember that we can assert a sentence is false just in case we would deny the sentence. But... If we remove the falsity predicate of the liar, if we try to remove that, well, what do we have left? Um, consider Maybe it's best to consider uh, a different claim of falsity. The sentence, snow is black, is false. Well, it's easy to see how this sentence gets its truth value. And again, you, know, you can just diagram it out. Um, the sentence, snow is black, is false, is acceptable to say because we would deny snow is black. You know, it's false. So, and that's based on the whiteness of snow. So, the sentence snow is black is false is true, and it's easy to see what makes it true. Uh, but with the liar, well, how would, we, how would we go about doing this? So, what Kripke says is, the problem with the liar is that it isn't grounded. It's ungrounded. There's a kind of vicious self-reference in play. You can't get down to a basic assertion that contains no truth predicate. You just get stuck in a loop, as it were. Um, so you see the, the problem of, of trying to do that. And that is why we should suppose that the liar is valueless. So this gives us 
uh, an independent reason for supposing that the liar is a valueless sentence. Um, now, one of the benefits of Kripke's approach here is that it actually solves problems brought up by non-paradoxical sentences as well. So, uh, consider this sentence. This sentence is true. Well, <clears throat> this isn't a paradox. If it's true, it's true, and if it's false, it's false. But its truth conditions are nevertheless completely obscure. We simply don't have enough information to determine whether we should rule it to be true or false. So, in many ways, the problem here is just just as great as the problem with the liar. I mean, it's not paradoxical, but we still don't really have a clue what we should assign this sentence, whether we should assign it true or false. Now, Kripke would say that the problem with this sentence, uh, just like the problem with the liar, is that it's ungrounded. Uh, we can't we can't sort of get down to a basic assertion that contains no truth predicate. Um, so Kripke's approach gives us some reason for thinking that the liar might be valueless, and it's also applicable in other areas because it gives us it's, it manages to solve other problems. It manages to solve problems brought up by other sentences. So there is much to to commend Kripke's uh, Kripke's approach here. Um, but now we need to consider the second problem for the value gap approach, the problem of revenge. And this is a far more serious problem. Okay, let's accept that the liar is a truth value gap. We'll concede that point. Uh, the problem is that it seems we can simply restate the paradox. So consider this, for example this sentence is not true, which is essentially just a form of this sentence is either false or valueless, because if it's false or if it's valueless, then it's not true. Well, this is the strengthened liar, or revenge, and there are many ways of phrasing uh, the strengthened liar, but you can see the, the basic problem here. Uh, sentence one here, if it's true, it's not true, and if it's not true, it's true. And we're not, we're not relying on bivalence here. This affects the person who accepts truth value gaps as much as it affects anybody else. Um, so it may be said that you know, oh well, it's you know illegitimate to um, to say that we can make those kind of inferences from valueless sentences. Um, but anybody who supposes that there are truth value gaps is surely committed to the following claims and they're enough to render this paradox a problem. Um, the supposition of truth value gaps simply doesn't solve the strengthened liar. And this, to my mind, means that it isn't really a solution at all. Um, the strengthened liar is clearly just as big a problem as the liar is, and truth value gaps don't touch it. So that's a pretty serious problem. Um, it, it should be obvious, by the way, that it would be completely futile to suppose that there's something else beyond truth and non-truth, beyond truth, falsity and valuelessness. So, for example, we might say, oh well, you know, the liar isn't true, false or valueless, it's just meaningless. Well, then we can simply make this uh, new uh, liar. And, um, I mean, aside from the question of whether or not meaninglessness would simply be not true, um, we can obviously create these these new liars at will, and then using um, these inferences uh, two and three, we clearly have a problem. Um, in general, uh, the, uh, one of the points that Graham Priest raises in in contradiction is um, you know, consider these sentences we saw earlier. This sentence is true, and this sentence is false. Well, there's a big difference between these sentences, really, at least superficially in that the first sentence seems to underdetermine truth value while the second overdetermines it with the first sentence we don't seem to be able to do anything with it you know we can assign truth and we can assign falsity but our usual principles of reasoning can't take us any further than that um, with the second we seem to have uh, an overabundance of truth values no matter what value we assign it it, it seems to demand the other one too, 
And as we can see with the strengthened layer, that's the case even if we say that it's valueless. So um, it's an interesting point about those two sentences there. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that uh, supposing that the liar is a truth value gap doesn't really work. It doesn't solve the strengthened liar. Um, so that's uh, probably not a very useful avenue. Well, uh, are there solutions that don't rely on truth value gaps? Indeed there are. And uh, I want to take a look at one of them. Um, Alfred Tarski had a rather uh, ingenious and somewhat complicated proposal and it doesn't rely on truth value gaps. So let's take a look at Tarski's solution to the liar. Right, now Tarski draws a distinction between semantically closed languages and semantically open ones. What does this mean? Well, this is simplifying somewhat. But we can say that a language is semantically closed when it's able to refer to its own expressions and it contains the predicates true and false. So that's a somewhat simplifying idea of semantic closure. A semantically closed language, language has these properties. Um, a, a semantically closed language then is one that can predicate truth and falsity of its own expressions. And pretty much all the natural languages are examples. Um, in English, French, Japanese, Mandarin, whatever, all of these languages are able to predicate truth or falsity of their own expressions. Now, we can use English to talk about English, and we can use English to predicate truth to other English sentences. So, for example, the first sentence of this paragraph is true. That's, that's just an example of that. We're using English to refer to another English sentence and we're predicating truth of it. Now, essentially, Tarski says that this is the problem. Semantic closure. Semantically closed languages are the problem. Of course, pretty much all natural languages are semantically closed. Tarski would say that natural languages are basically just hopeless. Uh, we can't, can't really do anything with them, but we can create artificial languages in which semantic closure doesn't obtain and uh, in which uh, liar sentences are blocked. So how do we create a semantically closed language? Well, we have to use the distinction between the object language and the meta language. Uh, this is a very important distinction which you should be aware of, but just in case you're not, I'll briefly rehearse it. So essentially, the object language is the language being studied, and the meta language is the language used to talk about the object language. So consider these sentences here. Schnee ist wies, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Schnee ist wies contains three words, uh, is a sentence of German, is true. Okay, in this case, the object language is German and the meta language is English. Uh, Schnee ist wies is a sentence of the object language and is in German. Uh, Schnee ist wies is true, this here, is a sentence of the meta language and is in English. Um, now, technically, in these above sentences, there is no German at all. Schnee ist wies is a German sentence, a sentence of the object language, but Schnee ist wies enclosed with quotes, like that, is a name in the English meta language for the above sentence. Um, so I hope you can see how that works. Um, now what's clear is that we can use English uh, to talk about English, we can use English as both object language and meta language. So consider this. Snow is white contains three words. Snow is white is a sentence of English. Snow is white is true. Well, in this case, we clearly have an English object, lang an English object language and an English meta language. We're studying English, we're talking about in an English sentence, and we're using English to talk about it. Um, okay, so that is the object language meta language distinction. Now, 
Recall the distinction between semantically closed and semantically open languages. Um, a language is semantically closed when it's able to refer to its own expressions and it contains the predicates true and false. Uh, so you could actually sort of rephrase this idea um, as a language is semantically closed when it can be used as its own meta-language because that's clearly what's going on here. We are using English to talk about English and we have these predicates of truth and falsity so that allows English to function as its own meta-language. We would say that uh, snow is white and snow is white is true are both sentences of the same language, English. Uh, so of course English is clearly semantically closed. Um, now Tarski's suggestion is that we need to define an artificial language in which semantic closure fails to hold. So how do we do this? Well, um, the, the basic idea is that we take the predicates true and false as being abbreviations. Abbreviations for true in the object language and false in the object language. Uh, so essentially what Tarski suggests is that we have um, two levels. Uh, when we say that snow is white, we, we're speaking on level zero, the object language. When we say snow is white is true, we're talking about level zero using level one. So hopefully you can see how that works. Uh, on Tarski's suggestion, we, we would not have one language, English. We would have level zero English, which contains sentences like snow is white, and then there would be level one English, which is, is a meta language, and which we use to talk about level zero English. And we can say things like snow is white is true. There's a bit of a, a problem here though, because uh, some sentences of course are true in the meta language, in level one English. For example, snow is white is true, is itself true. So how do we avoid semantic closure for the meta language? Well, we simply go up another level to level two, the meta meta language. Um, and you can see how this can extend indefinitely. Snow is white is true, is true would be a sentence of the meta meta language. And then you could add is true again, and you would go up another level to level three and so on. Tarski proposes a, a hierarchy of languages, an infinite hierarchy of languages and imposes the restriction that sentences can only predicate truth or falsity on the sentences of a lower level than themselves. Um, so this is what's going on basically. Uh, we have our object language where we would say snow is white, then we say snow is white is true on the level one meta language, level two meta meta language and it just goes on and on like that. So you can see how this uh, works. Any sentence that ends with is true or is false is talking about a sentence of a lower level. Uh, okay, so you should then have a basic sense of how to create semantically open languages. But how does this solve the liar? Well, uh, it's fairly simple. So um, here's our, our liar. This sentence is false. Now remember that false is just an abbreviation for false in the object language. So we have this sentence is false in the object language. And with this, the paradox is pretty easily solved. 1a here isn't a sentence of the object language. It's a sentence of the meta language. 1a doesn't appear in the object language. Truth and falsity are meta language concepts. So the liar isn't part of the object language. Uh, so uh, obviously it can't be a problem for the object language. Well, what about the meta language? What uh, truth value does the liar have in the meta language? Um, well, it's pretty obvious that uh, in the meta language it's simply false. And it's not false in any paradoxical sense. Uh, 1a claims to be false in the object language and it isn't. It isn't part of the object language. So it's simply false. Um, there's no paradox. Uh, and you can see this quite clearly, I think, if we take another diagram here. Um, well, look, it's not in the object language. There's no sentence there. 
in in the meta language we have the sentence this sentence is false in the object language but that's just plain false um, this sentence is false is false in the meta language and um, there is there is no paradox Tarski's solution prevents any sentence attributing falsity to itself because it prevents any sentence attributing truth or falsity to any sentence of the same level and that's what blocks the paradox uh, you know, we, we have a sentence which tries to attribute falsity to itself but it can't do that because it can only attribute falsity to sentences of a lower level so the liar on Tarski's view is, is, uh, is just false um, and not in any paradoxical way um, it should be clear that Tarski's solution applies equally to the strength and the liar um, so his solution is broad and, and notable for that um, but it's worth pointing out that, in a sense, Tarski is embracing the liar. It is a contradiction, according to Tarski, at least for our natural languages. And on that, he agrees with the dialotheists. The difference between Tarski and the dialotheists is that Tarski concludes that natural languages should therefore be rejected and replaced with artificial ones. Natural languages according to Tarski, are simply incoherent, irredeemably so. Um, but it may be said then that the benefits of his theory come at rather too high a price. Um, to, to jettison our natural languages, to demand that we instead construct this uh, rather ad hoc, infinite framework of artificial languages uh, just because of a, a paradox seems... Uh, to me to be a fairly extreme response to the problem um, I mean it's it's a rather ingenious solution but it's it is quite quite complicated it's you know it's impractical it's cumbersome and it's very counterintuitive uh, so we might say that the benefits come at too high a cost um, right then I want to take a look at one more solution and uh, this one doesn't rely on uh, truth value gaps and nor does it rely on these uh, complicated theoretical constructions uh, this solution was suggested by Arthur Pryor um, well uh, Pryor never really uh, developed this solution um, but uh, the, the basic suggestion comes from him he, he died before he could fully develop it but the the basic idea here is that Every sentence implicitly asserts its own truth. All sentences implicitly assert their own truth. So for every sentence, um, it is true that, or and this sentence is true, or some similar construction, is always implicitly attached to the sentence. Um, for example, Frank Zappa was a musician, just is, it is true that Frank Zappa was a musician. Frank Zappa was a musician implicitly asserts it is true that Frank Zappa was a musician or uh, we could say Frank Zappa was a musician and this statement is true something like that the point is it implicitly asserts its own truth okay so now consider the liar this sentence is false well this translates to it is true that this sentence is false or this sentence is true and this sentence is false and so in Pryor's view the liar doesn't just assert its own falsity, it asserts both its own truth and its own falsity. Thus, it's not that we derive a contradiction from the liar, rather it simply boldly asserts a contradiction. So, it's simply false. It just asserts a contradiction, and that makes it false. Now that seems to be a fairly good solution, it's certainly quite, um, quite a simple solution, Unfortunately, there's uh, a fairly serious problem with this approach, and um, it, it can be illustrated by considering the contingent paradoxes. So, um, a, a point that was made uh, quite forcefully by Saul Kripke is that the, the liar paradox can, can depend on contingent facts. So, um, here's the example he gives. So, so imagine we have two presidential candidates, Smith and Jones, and Smith says of Jones that majority of what Jones says about me is false, 
all jo- and all Jones says of Smith is uh, Smith is a big spender. Smith is soft on crime, and everything Smith says about me is true. Now um, we then we then suppose that two and three are true. Well, what should we then say about one and four? Pretty clearly, if you work it out, we have here a liar paradox. Um, now the problem for for our for for Pryor's view uh, is that we can say that each of these statements implicitly asserts its own truth, but we don't seem to have gotten out of of the paradox. The paradox is still there. We can add, uh, and this statement is true, to every statement here, and the paradox remains. Pryor hasn't solved it. So contingent paradoxes uh, are, I think, a problem for for Pryor's approach. And in fact, they're a problem for for many approaches. Um, So suppose, for example, we were to argue that liar sentences are simply meaningless, say. Say we was to go down that route of saying that they're simply meaningless. Well, how would we explain 1 and 4? Was 1 meaningful until Jones uttered 4 and then suddenly became meaningless? That would be a deeply counterintuitive conclusion. Um, So any approach to the liar has to take account of the... has to take into account these contingent paradoxes. It has to take into account the fact that the liar can depend on on empirical facts. It's not simply a theoretician's construction. Uh, Kripke's general point here is just that there's nothing intrinsic to paradoxical sentences that make them paradoxical. There's nothing intrinsic to one and four that make them paradoxical. It's only in this particular uh, contingent scenario that they become paradoxical. So uh, there we are. Um, we've we've seen uh, the liar paradox. We've seen the liar paradox in its various guises, and we've seen a few suggested solutions to the liar. Okay, well uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about today. Um, I uh, hope you found that interesting, and I uh, hope you now see uh, the the problem that uh, these kinds of paradoxes pose. Uh, the dialetheist points out that we have known of this kind of paradox for thousands of years and there doesn't seem to be any clear way of of resolving of resolving it solutions to the liar tend to be extremely cumbersome or we end up being able to simply rephrase it in different terms uh, but um, you never know somebody might come up with with something one day um, anyway that was all I wanted to talk about today in the next video uh, we'll look at some more paradoxes but I think this is enough for now. Uh, So thanks for watching. Goodbye.